I'm Joseph. And I'm Nick. And this is Fish Jelly. Uh, da, da, da. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Okay. Oh, yeah? Today's Christmas Eve. Yeah. Uh, so there's that. Mm-hmm. We received a lot of nice messages and gifts. A so gift. we'd like to say thank you. Mm, merci that. beaucoup. Very sweet. Um, I was going to continue or start a conversation we had in the live yesterday. Oh, yeah. For maybe because people seem to like that <laughs> or uh-huh. the topic we were talking about, which was someone asked us to respond to the Color Purple Press Tour and the things Taraji P. Henson has been saying. Basically, she's just saying that she's had a difficult time getting the kind of work and pay she feels she deserves. She even commented that she had to fight for her money on the color purple. A lot of people commented on her body language during this current press tour. So we had just talked about it for quite some time. Uh, Mm -hmm. We both agree that she should certainly advocate for herself and more people should. Mm -hmm. My sort of addendum to that was I think she may be shooting herself in the foot because while the audience might congratulate her for speaking up, the people who would actually hire her might avoid her. Well, and so that was my concern. For yes. Her. Yeah. Of course that, but somebody, I, I, I think it's brave that, you know, she's choosing to speak about it when she wants to speak about it. But, but again, yeah, historically, especially women, well, and you know, predominantly white women in the history of Hollywood that spoke out were punished, but you know, we're living in a different, uh, time and place. Well, not place, but where the gatekeepers aren't just white people that are going to be potentially angry at hearing, having her hear that. And, you know, the other gatekeepers like, okay, maybe Oprah won't want to work with her again, but Oprah's not the only game in town. There's a lot of people that would want to work with her. I think, I think, She's also brave, but I think, you know, you can be brave and stupid. And I think, <laughs> yes, but she, you know, Oprah's not the only game in town. Taraji P. Henson's not the only game in town. And the only thing people would know her from, like, depending on the kind of project she wants, would be as playing a very specific character, being Cookie on Empire. Mm-hmm. I feel like that role is probably has probably limited her. And that's why she hasn't been getting the kind of offers she thinks she should. And I just think being easy to work with, that's often weaponized. Like, because I was advocating for self for, for myself because I spoke up about something, now I'm difficult. And, you know, of course, like Monique sort of derailed, her career was derailed after she didn't want to do press for Precious because she wasn't going to be paid. Mm-hmm. And I totally... Those are you fair know, things. I mean, I don't want to work for free either. But I think, you know, the other thing is people don't really realize what's going on. Lots of people just assume that uh, everything is taken care of for these people on, in these year long press tours that happen and stuff. And it's like, no, actually. Uh, I will say, though, I think in my own career, I've been able to get ahead because I did do things that maybe were outside of the scope of what I may have been compensated for with the idea that like, oh, if I come across as easy to work with, that might benefit me in the future, which it has. For sure. But then I I think the flip side of that is these are like Monique and Taraji. These are people that have a successful careers. They are notable people. They're talented people. And I think at a point the frustration comes is like, well, when am I going to be treated that way? Uh, by this industry that I'm working in. But I don't know that it's linear in the way that, you know, if you're a nurse, like an RN, and you have your two-year RN, and then you go back and get your BSN, and then you get your MSN, and then you get all those certifications they put on their office plaque that allow them to continue to grow in their career, those are quantifiable things that should warrant um, promotions and pay raises because we can qualify and quantify your skill level when it comes to art, which is what acting is. I just don't know that 
just because you've done X number of projects or you got this nomination or this award or because people like you in this, that doesn't necessarily translate to a dollar amount because the reality is the most talented actor, you know, like if we can all agree someone's very talented, that doesn't mean that the project they're in will be a success. So then someone has to front that money. And it's really easy to be like, well, these corporations, these um, studios, but they're not these like infinite wells of money. They have shareholders they have to be accountable to. So it is a business. It is a business, but there's there are broader uh, issues at play here, particularly if we're speaking. So if we're speaking of women, that there's a legacy of like, well, women, we only pay women this much. So that is why you're getting this offer. If you're a black woman, you're going to get even less than that because that is that 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 is the uh, part of the the caste system of, of what's uh, and how payment is involved in that. So the only way to change that is for people to be very loud and and vocal about the bullshit. You can be as loud as you want, but the numbers have to make sense. Like you know Monique was saying like how could Amy Schumer get paid the kind of money Dave Chappelle was and Chris Rock and well and that she was offered peanuts and it's like well because Amy Schumer had had well, she was a number one a, movie a hot streak. Yeah, she had a hot streak. She was selling out arenas. So Netflix knew that her comedy special would be streamed at a level that would warrant that pay. Monique would not. And I'm sure Monique's Netflix special who we we talked about her Netflix special more than once on the podcast and the YouTube channel mm -hmm. and people didn't even know she had a special mm -hmm. people didn't even know she came out as queer technically. So clearly she didn't get the kind of audience that someone like Amy Schumer did. And that is why she did not get paid the money mm -hmm. to me. I think it's just numbers because if, if she did, they would have paid her what she's worth to them. That's the other thing. Value is relative. Yeah, maybe from for someone my age range and my background, yeah, Monique has much more value to me than an Amy Schumer. Mm -hmm. Like, I watch the Parkers and I love the Queens of Comedy. Like, I know Monique. So if I had to choose one, I would definitely choose Monique. But Netflix knows their demographics. They know their streaming habits. Like, they knew that she would not warrant a $10 million payday. And that's why they offered her ass 250000 because that's what they thought that she would bring I, in. Yes, and in retrospect, it's like, well, what she should have done is take that money and have a killer set. If you ask me, that's what she should have done. But and, Because and, the exposure. And then in the background, the thing is like it – it's much easier to say these things. It's like, like Taraji, you know, what if she, it, I don't know. You can't predict the future. So she's seizing the opportunity to speak her truth now, but it's like, how much more powerful would it be if like, say she won the Oscar and then she's like, Oh, by the way, I had to struggle to get pay what I was worth on this black production. <laughs> well, you know? if you ask me, I would say that would still be a stupid thing for her to do. I think it's a real thing and a brave thing. And I, I definitely agree with, why you feel that 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 it would be but i just don't know that shooting yourself in the foot is going to help anyone certainly not yourself and well what her statement in those clips i'm watching is also about the the, the women that are coming up behind her so if she doesn't say if she's not going to say something who is and i think we need to choose our battles and sometimes i mean i also think it's a little odd that you choose this predominantly black production which is sort of being led by a, a very powerful black woman that's who, true who is problematic in some ways but i think we have to appreciate her for what she represents it's like you kind of choose this project well, it's to like, be real outspoken and cry on everyone's stage about how you don't get paid what you deserve and of course we all so now on social media everyone's assuming like every if, if you hashtag taraji p henson every tiktok video is people talking about how she and oprah have beef so now it's like you brought this negative energy to this project that's supposed to be uplifting. about uplifting yeah. and black sisterhood and it, yeah it to me it just seems like it's it could backfire in her face much like ray don chong and oprah you know look at <laughs> 
Well, speaking of other color, pur- the previous color purple's beef. And I'm sure some of that is punitive, and I would argue that that's not fair. But like I mentioned in the live, if I were a producer, I wouldn't work with Taraji P. Henson just based off of this. Really? And I her attitude. That, I, I wouldn't. I... There are a lot of really talented, beautiful black women in their 50s who can act. Like, I, who would, like, she's not the only game in town. And we have to be realistic. Sure. Uh, but I, 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 I don't see the, the need to, well, even, even kind of what Monique had to go through to get kind of back on track. And she, you know, she is, has been in stuff and she's worked with Lee Daniels again. Uh, but if we take this situation and apply it to regular people like us, right? So like if, if I have an employee at my corporate job where we do a basic thing that, you know, like we're, we're not famous, we're not rich, no one knows about us, but here we are. And I have an employee who, you know, comes to me and says like, I deserve more money. I want to raise. Okay, well, what have you done that exceeds the expectation? What are you willing to do to warrant this pay increase? Oh, you want a title change? Well, does does the business need uh, match this desired role you want? I mean, if this were like a real job, like a nine to five that most of us work, this sort of attitude wouldn't necessarily apply, right? Mm-hmm. Sure. Like you kind of, it, like it's not always fair and people have preferences too like it's not fair but it's no a, filmmaker is obligated the, to give her a role right if like, the disparity is such that it needs to be corrected i mean that 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 is a, a real problem and then th- this may be controversial but whenever actors talk about having difficulty getting roles i immediately assume it's them in the same way when you meet someone who's always talking about how like dating is so hard men in trash are like men in LA are trash I've been on 38 dates in 2023 and none of them turned into anything what would be the first thing you would think the common denominator is you you bitch (laughs) it's you girl I just think there are there have been like actors over the years who have had similar complaints and I just think, like, I think maybe it's you. Like, maybe you're difficult. What? what? Sure. There. I mean, it. It's not. Uh, it, it, there could be multiple reasons. Why can't yes. Halle Berry keep a man? Why can't oh, Halle God. Berry like like? Why is her career not better? I. I just think like. But there, I, there's some truth in what what she's what they're being offered, and there's a, a you know, uh, th- 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 they're only being considered for certain things. Maybe I don't want to diminish her, you know, feelings and what is probably happening to her. I'm just making it a bigger statement about it. Just it's also maybe falling on deaf ears because, you know, there is a difficult (laughs) there. there, Say like somebody like we know somebody personally who is a, a, a known actor. And after her first big film, which was still an, a really small film, but it was a lead part in this indie film directed by somebody notable. And then all of a sudden she was auditioning for roles that were going to people like Halle Berry, but, but she still wasn't notable. So then, then. Yeah, but she kept her, that type of person. She kept her head down and kept working and continued to do a lot. And then has been on a successful series too. Yeah. So I think that, but, but I mean, if you ask me, her, the person you're talking about, I think that, that her approach seems more appropriate to me. It's like, yeah, things don't seem fair and there are injustices and, you know, it's not just race, it's gender. And, mm-hmm. but it's like, you keep going and I don't know that I'm not saying never speak out. I'm just saying that if you choose to speak out, there may be repercussions. So my personality would be that I could probably benefit myself and others more if I just continue to put in the hard work and then maybe someday I'll be in a position where I can affect change in a different way. Sure. But you I know. also, I also agree. I, I, I think that there's, it's powerful. It's powerful to speak truth to power as well. So I, I, I mean, we'll, we'll see how this all plays out for her, but I wasn't, uh, bothered by her doing that and it seems that people have very strong opinions about it it's like maybe we should just back up and uh let let the room breathe 
I'm definitely a like non-confrontational, non-violent approach to things, but I also respect people who feel like, no, like we need to take a stand. Like we need to be aggressive and loud. I I don't have a very strong opinion against you that. You know, squeaky wheel gets the grease, right? I don't know. Like if so if Yeah, if, but then to call attention, see, but again, it's just my personality to call attention to yourself in a negative way because again, for all of us who support her and think she's great, it's like good for her. And I genuinely mean that. Like good for her for speaking her mind. She clearly felt like she needed to say something. Mm -hmm. But then for the people who actually are in control because we're not that doesn't appeal to them. Sure. Yeah. I, and, like, you know, wh when I was managing a team, like, yeah, the employees who would constantly complain and want something else. And it's like, can you just do your job? Like, I don't think what you're asking for is wrong. And I, you know, there would be a lot of times when the, what the person was asking for, it's like, you know, I wish we could do that for you. That would be great, but we can't. Mm -hmm. So you become a nuisance to me. Like, Every time, like I, I cringe every time I see that you're requesting some one-on-one -on -one time with me because I, like, I know you're going to talk about money and duties and, and raises and title changes. Like, mm -hmm. so it's not that I don't think people deserve things, but it's also, you know, we all want things to be a little easier. And I'm just saying that I can't imagine these filmmakers, many of whom have difficult, a difficult time getting projects off the ground. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then you think these streaming platforms that, you know, have their hands wrapped around everyone's necks. It's like they have, they wield a lot of power. Yeah. And these executives at Netflix or Amazon or Hulu or whatever, you know, if, if they get a bad feeling about someone, if, if executives at Netflix are like, this Taraji character, I don't know. That lady's never going to be on a Netflix show. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's like, that seems like a big portion of the pie to just throw down the shitter. Yes. But I think that's all I would say about that for now, I guess. Mm -hmm. Like you said, we'll see how. We'll see how it goes. This I evolves. I hope it works out well for her. There was a question um, about animation because you had said that you really didn't love that first Spider-Man Spider-Verse movie. And then I had commented that I didn't like how it looked. So there was a question about like, which animation style do we like? And I think we both agree. Like I, it, it's not how the movie looks, it's the story. And then if I don't love the story and I think it looks weird, mm -hmm. like the Spider-Man movie, it doesn't help. There are times when the look of a film does help, but you were saying that there are like six animation styles. I believe so, five or six. But yeah, I don't I, have a preference. I don't have a preference. It, uh, I didn't. I don't love the Spider-Man animated films because I don't inherently love the self-reflexivity, the endless uh, self-referential bullshit that supplies supposedly what's called comedy in those films. Um, I, I don't. I just don't care for. I, I just don't care for superheroes. I just thought that the animation looked like it was supposed to be in 3D, but I didn't get the 3D glasses. So that just, you know, I didn't love that. But yeah, it didn't. it's kind of like uh, Miyazaki's films. Like uh, I really love Spirited Away, but, you know, we watching my neighborhood Totoro, it's like, I don't like precocious children that are screaming and wailing through a whole movie. So, you know, those Miyazaki films, which focus on residious little girls, I, I, don't, I don't like as much. And that has nothing to do with the animation style. It's purely uh, the story and the grading characters that I have to sit with for however long. In the sorry to this man section, there were a lot of comments about. Oh, I already forgot. Yeah. The Iron Claw and how there's a sixth brother who killed himself and. I mean, is that in the film? No. <laughs> so okay, so I, I I was responding to the what was presented in the film. Then, but yeah, I feel like, yeah. I mean, I don't know why the filmmaker didn't include that, but that wasn't in the film. So, I mean, how would I have known anyway? But there's that. And then we reviewed a film called Anyone But You, mm -hmm. and one of the most grating characters I've experienced in a long time is played by an actor named Gata, who I guess is a rapper. But 
No, it's, it's Gata. Pronounced. Sorry, Gata. I kept calling him Gata. I was calling him Gata too. Yeah, it's apparently it's like alligator. And then someone said spelled like alligator, but alligator is not spelled that way. But whatever. I certainly don't want to deliberately mispronounce someone's name. Well, but you know, not. proper nouns are difficult because sometimes they don't make sense. I the mean, English language doesn't make sense. The English but... language doesn't make sense. But you know, well, one, I you know, I'm, I'm white, so uh, I, I, not. I mean, I like some rap and hip hop i would probably i, I, I would not... probably discontinue this conversation and just say that this person's name is gata and well, we did not mean to mispronounce it i did not mean to mispronounce it but i would say that a you, wa- i feel you're gonna do yourself a hole no a, a, <laughs> a, a g-a-y or a g-a-e would uh, automatically give the english speaker i think an you are digging yourself okay. a hole i just would stop that okay moving on to projects of interest out of this world I'm trying to, oh, see, you pivoted too fast. I don't have my notes up. Something by Albert Sarah. Oh, Albert Sarah's new movie. Yeah, he is apparently, well, I really liked his last, well, I've liked all his films that I've seen, but Pacifiction with uh, Benoit Majumel was pretty damn good. Uh, You didn't see it. And uh, he's working on something that's probably going to come out in 2025. I'm thinking it's shooting this summer. It's uh, dealing with, uh I, th- I think what's going on in ukraine uh so it's going to be another kind of political film from him but yeah so that's exciting to me and secret agents uh kleber mendonza filho the brazilian director uh, apparently he's going to work with uh wagner mura uh for his new film which sounds like some spy espionage type thing all right so we're doing something new we're going to start a patreon or patron. I'm not quite sure how to pronounce it. Uh, I didn't bother to look it up. I but, think it's Patreon. <laughs> but but I've I've already started it. There is a little bit of content there already. It hasn't been published yet. I'm I'm waiting for there to be more things before I expect people to sign up. But what we're going to do uh for one is the movies for fun section will move to the Patreon. Mm-hmm. Because I think these podcasts can get a little long and there has been feedback that, yeah, like it seems like that section may not be, it It, it may be served better to be on its own. So I thought that would be a, a good thing to remove from the podcast and then put it onto the Patreon. Oh, you didn't tell me about this feedback. Well, just that, yeah. Well, because then it would, may allow for like more time spent on certain films. It may also allow to actually like, list out the films we're talking about okay because it's really hard to reference because sometimes we'll talk about a film at length in this section Mm -hmm. and then when someone asks have we talked about it it's hard to but if i make it a separate section i could actually list out the films so that it can be referenced but that will be part of it we're going to do singular reviews of films we didn't do for the youtube channel like films that we didn't catch as a new release and now they're like a month or two old Mm -hmm. you know something like leave the world behind or like rebel moon Mm -hmm. things like that where we didn't really have an interest in seeing it but then like everyone keeps asking us to review it Mm -hmm. and then we're working on a way to allow people to request reviews since that seems to be a huge portion of the comments we get is people asking us to review movies. We obviously can't watch all the movies people ask us to watch. So I I think a good way to filter that is to um, make people pay for that. So, (laughs) so I'm trying to figure out a dollar amount that makes sense, but that would be an option that someone could pay. And and it's such a burden for you to figure that out, you know? Uh, Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, so someone could say like, this month I want you to review Gone with the Wind. So then we will do like a singular review that we would post about Gone with the Wind. So I would recommend, you know, probably choosing movies that mean something to you and not just trying to get me to watch like the new big thing streaming on Netflix. Sure. But, yeah. <laughs> but that's that. So that means we would move on now to the obituary section. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, there are two entries. Uh, Otar... I asked, uh, Otar, I, I asked, <laughs> he's a George, he's a, probably the most famous Georgian filmmaker ever. Otor, I, 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 uh, 
um, who I've seen a few things of his, including his last film, uh, Winter Something, <laughs> starring uh, Matthew Amalric. But he's probably best known. Also, uh, Amalric was in his big, his biggest film is, uh, I think it's 1984's Favorites of the Moon, which is a really vibrant, beautiful film, if you haven't seen it. I know uh, Cohen Media Group restored it and put it on Blu-ray probably a decade ago, but uh, w- that's really worth seeking out. But uh, And a lot of his stuff is kind of unavailable. But yeah, he was 89. And Shirley Ann Field. This is a British actress. She actually died. I forgot to mention her probably a couple, probably two podcast sessions ago but she was uh 87 and there's this uh, joseph losey film she did called the damned which i have been meaning to watch and i haven't had time but uh that sounds very interesting to me all right well let's take a break this week's secret film was my choice and i chose the 2003 comedy film girls will be girls Mm -hmm. Why did I choose this film? There's a character in it named Evie, played by Jack Plotnick. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if this was before or after the film. It it might've been the inspiration for this character, but he did, um, he, he did this character and made a YouTube video and it was called Christmas Evie. Mm -hmm. So I always think about Christmas Evie. And so I thought, Oh, girls will be girls. That, character singing Christmas songs is not in this movie. So this is not a holiday movie no. by any means, but it's just, <laughs> it's the Christmas Eve. And since today is, is Christmas, Christmas Eve, Eve, that's the <laughs> connection. And also I got tired of Christmas movies because we reviewed like six of them already. <laughs> yeah. I'm, t- I'm ready for Christmas. I don't know if it's because we watched an inordinate amount of Christmas movies for us. So I feel like I'm ready for the season to end now. Yeah, so this movie was sort of an attempt at transitioning out of Christmas. But what is Girls Will Be Girls about? Three actresses at various places on the Hollywood food chain navigate the minefield of love, aging, and ambition. Oh, and they're all played by men. (laughs) That sounds like the original log line. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, When were you introduced to this film? Oh, I think a pair of old queens had an after party once and put this on. And that was the first time I'd seen it until we all fell asleep. But, um, which would have been probably 2006. I remember renting this when I still lived in Vegas and I would make my, you know, weekly trips to Hollywood video to see what else is in the gay section. Oh, Hollywood video. And I remember thinking it was a lot of fun. Yes. You know, I remember passing by the DVD cover on the shelf and bypassing it because I didn't like the cover. (laughs) It's a low budget short film. It's like, what is it? Like 80 minutes? Mm -hmm. I mean, and it looks real cheap. But it works, I think. I think it works. I find it very charming. The three leads are so good. And I think a testament of like what what drag queens could really be capable of that the the uh the continuous mill of people running through rupaul's drag race could learn a bitter thing or two from yeah because even though that premise i read calls out the fact they're men i don't ever think about the three main characters as men in the film i said i have a friend that that, that a lady with an adam apple adam's apple <laughs> Okay, so this movie. So Evie is played by Jack Plotnick, and Evie is this washed up alcoholic Mm -hmm. actress who lives somewhere in LA in this house, and she rents one of her rooms out to a woman named Coco, played by Coco Peru. Mm -hmm. And so we see them living together. Evie's awful. And one day she tells Coco, Oh, I rented out your room to this new girl who's coming today. So of course Coco's upset because she has to move into a smaller room she doesn't like. That's called the bicentennial That's called the bicentennial room. (laughs) But apparently she's not allowed to redecorate. So this new girl shows up and her name is Varla. Varla Jean Merman. Played by the drag queen Varla Jean Merman. And Varla is a little starlet. She's moved to LA to become an actress. And right away we learn that her mother was an actress named Marla. <laughs> and in flashbacks, Marla is played by Varla, except Varla has red hair. And her mother had blonde hair. Mm-hmm. But we find out that Evie 
knew Marla. They were sort of rivals. Okay, so we see through the film that Evie's becoming jealous of Varla because Varla's actually getting work. At first, she becomes a prostitute. <laughs> so there's this sequence where she's been tricked by a pimp. But Evie's son, Stevie, falls in love with Varla. He's an attorney with and somehow micro, helps her get acting gigs. With a micro penis. Yeah. With a micro. I don't even think you can call it a micro penis. It looked like. <laughs> I have a skin tag bigger than that thing look. <laughs> but anyway, Varlo's career is on the rise. So, of course, Evie is super jealous and mad. But at a point, Varlo says, hey, why don't you do one of those late night infomercials and just make it like a one woman variety show? I'll give you $10,000 towards the 40000 you need to do it. And Evie's like, yeah, I'll get a second mortgage on my house and I'll do it. <laughs> to pay for this, yeah. So the end of the movie is this hol or this uh, television special called Evie, and isn't it, isn't it all about Evie or all about Evie? Is it? I don't know. Um, but as the special starts, we can see that there's something wrong with Evie, and so immediately we think Varla sabotaged her. But we find out it's actually Coco. Coco drugged her because she just hates her. So during this variety show, because Evie's like hallucinating, she tells the truth about what happened to Varla's mother. And we find out that Varla's mother had been cast in this big movie called Asteroid. Mm -hmm. But Evie wanted the role, so she sabotaged Marla. So Evie is actually the star of Asteroid, and that's like her one claim to fame. Mm -hmm. As a result, Varla became depressed and killed herself. So Evie is responsible for, as the film is saying, the death of Marla. So all is revealed. Evie has to sell her house because, of course, she didn't make any money off of this train wreck of a special. Varla is now like a working actress and she's in a relationship with Stevie and Coco <laughs> Coco married when she was younger um, she had to get an abortion and she fell in love with the abortion doctor mm -hmm. but then they never reconnected she got pregnant again so she'd have another chance at seeing the abortion yeah doctor. she actually had to which, which we can talk about but she ends up meeting this doctor many years later like in current time because she gets into a car accident. And, and so the ER doctor, so this abortion doctor, I guess, transitioned to being an ER doctor. Mm -hmm. He actually drugs and rapes her, <laughs> but they fall in love and get married. So now Coco, call it that, yeah. Coco moves off. So I guess everyone has a happy ending. This movie is ridiculous. It is very bizarre, yes. Uh, if you don't, you know, I had a movie night for this uh, where, and you were there, with double feature with this and Myra Breckenridge. I don't remember. Okay. I know I've seen this movie more than a few times. Mm -hmm. uh, so Jack Plotnick is Evie looks so sinewy and wears like this, like pixie cut wig. And the joke is that he wears dentures, has a glass eye. Um, all he does is drink. When he first gets up, like that first day we meet him, as soon as he pops into the kitchen and sees Coco, he goes, oh, nothing like that first puke of the day. <laughs> <laughs> and then when we meet Varla and Evie's talking about her mother, once she realizes that this girl is her daughter, she says that, oh, yeah, your mother offed herself. Oh, I'm sorry, passed herself away. <laughs> She's so mean. She's like, Marla's such a nice name. It's also it's also a fat name. Yeah. That bicentennial room was so ugly. Yes. It reminded me of the season of Drag Race where Alexis Mateo did the BAM and she was wearing that like American flag outfit. Yes. Mm -hmm. If someone made like decorated a room out of that outfit. Salute to the troops. Yeah. yeah, that's what this room looks like. Um, so there's a moment like Evie is so self-absorbed and can't stand Coco. And at a point, Coco is trying to be vulnerable with Evie and explain to her like about her abortion. And she's crying in the room with Evie <laughs> and telling her full story. 
And then when she looks back to get Evie's response, we see that Evie put on headphones. <laughs> uh, the flashback to Coco, where she has the long brunette wig, she looks like Dolly Wells to me. She looks nice. Mm -hmm. Probably the line I remember from this film the most is when Coco tells Evie about her abortion, Evie's like, that's what you're mad about, girl? I've had more children pulled out of me than a burning orphanage. <laughs> yep, that's a good one. That's a classic line. I'm sad you don't remember the movie night because I made a, a, I invented a drink called a Burning Orphanage that I served people. That kind of sounds familiar. Okay. So, yeah, you already mentioned this, but so Coco, when she first visits the abortion doctor and has the procedure, she feels like they had a strong connection. So then when she goes back to the clinic, of course, the receptionist won't give out the doctor's name to protect him. So her only plan is to get pregnant again so she can go back in. So we get a little montage of her having sex with all these men. <laughs> doctor, and she calls him Dr. Perfect. And then we find out that he only works on Tuesdays. And when she finds out she's pregnant, it's on a Tuesday. So she's like, it was meant to be. But when she goes back, um, he is there. But she sees that he has a wedding ring. So then she's devastated. It's so, I mean, this movie is so, <laughs> I guess the word would be problematic. I don't know. Well, yeah, it's supposed to be. It's, it's so inappropriate. Comedy. So Varla, she thinks, she keeps saying Tina Turner, but I think she means Lana Turner. She means Lana Turner. Was yeah. discovered at a diner. Schwab's pharmacy or whatever. So Yeah. So she's like, all I have to do is go sit at, the, and you know, Varla is a big old man in a dress. So she's always hungry. So she's at this diner with like every item on the menu on the table. And then this very handsome, like European man approaches her and is basically a pimp. But we find out that in his country, which is this fake country, it's like, you know, Bulgariana Stan or, something. or something crazy. He says they don't babe. So every he so stinks, so right. the joke is that he stinks, and then of course this movie's low budget, so it basically looks like they put some effect on the camera to make everything blurry. I think it's funny. It's cheesy for sure. Um, and then once we realize, because it's all innuendo, like of what he wants her to do initially, but then we see that she's dressing differently, and she has a beeper yeah. strapped to her bra. <laughs> then we see that varla she got her first like actor gig she's doing commercials for this tv dinner mm -hmm. that's uh that features so so it's like one of those frozen tv meals but it features this new technology called nutridation which means like it has some sort of like like radioactive particles radioactive that. something particles that um Make it mi warm. mimic the sensation of heat in your mouth and then it, it reads off all the warnings like not safe for consumption causes cancer but, and then one of the flavors you noticed was beef, but it's spelled B E P H. B E P H, yeah. <laughs> so stupid. And also the restaurant where she meets her pimp, it's a C grade restaurant, but they they put the C on a sign that says no <gasps> coffee. Refills. That's what that was. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? I'm so glad you mentioned that because I all the times I watched this movie, it never like I never meant understood what that meant, but yeah, they're trying to make the C grade restaurant. <laughs> they're, they're trying to hide it. No, <laughs> so Evie's big movie is asteroids. So we get a scene from this movie. And if anyone's listened to this podcast before, I know you've heard us say astrophysicist. Yeah. <laughs> this is where that movie comes from because we see that Evie's not a good actor yeah. and her character is supposed to be an astrophysicist, but she can't say the word. <laughs> So the way it plays out in the film is it, funny. It's clearly took many takes for her to get that out. <laughs> yeah. So Coco has all this trauma because she's remembered, you know, about her sexual assault and the abortion doctor. So the, the stress of it is causing her to slowly hack off her pinky toe with a nail file. <laughs> so, you know, Evie's vile to everyone, including her son, Stevie. And at a point, they get into an argument, and Stevie asks his mother, what have you ever done for me? And she goes, Carrie, you to term for starters. Coco would have had you sucked out for a phone number. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Barla's talking about like the things she's learned through her experience dealing with the pimp. And she says, feelings are like treasures, so bury them. <laughs> 
There's also a running gag of Coco farting. And you know, yes. farting is always funny to me. Mm-hmm. Okay, we've also made this joke before. I think I made it yesterday in our live about Coco's proposal from Dr. Perfect. Mm-hmm. He's basically saying to her, like, can I reasonably expect better? So you and I should stop chasing happy and settle for each other. <laughs> you know, people do that. You know, people think like that. Then there's a moment when Stevie finds Varla's diary and he confronts her like, I think you came here to sabotage my mother. And so he's reading the diary and she's like, that was a brilliant years ago <laughs> before I discovered spiritualicity or something. <laughs> so Varla Jean Merman, the drag performer, who I think is very popular um, in Provincetown, mm-hmm. like she's one of the queens who always has a show during the season. I knew this before this movie that she's known for because she can sing like opera Mm -hmm. and she's known for singing opera while shooting cheese whiz into her mouth. Yeah, you see it. So she does it uh, in the movie, which is pretty cool. It's cool, but it's uh, couched in uh, like it's a dirty secret she has. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So the special Evie's doing is being shot at Glendale City College. (laughs) And they tell this bitch, everything's on green screen. So do not wear anything that's like green or blue. Or purple, yeah. And the first thing she, so when she shows up for her first number, she's wearing a green dress. So the opening is just her head bouncing (laughs) around. (laughs) Um, And then her special ends because she's high as a kite with her naked. Mm -hmm. And I, that scene, I remember, the first time I saw it, I was shocked because they have Jack Plotnick in this bodysuit. So Mm -hmm. he has like these sagging breast and this bulbous furry vagina this pudenda mm-hmm. and then the final scene when everyone's saying their goodbyes because evie's selling the house and coco reveals that she's pregnant <laughs> and her husband dr perfect he had a little we, we get a moment where he's weak and he has um sex with evie weak so at the end he confronts evie like you gave me herpes oh that by the way that's play, he's played by eric stone street of modern family Oh my gosh. Yeah. So that the gay couple from Modern Family, the um the not redhead guy plays Dr. Not, Perfect. Not Jesse Ferguson or whatever. Sam Pancake is in the movie. Oh yeah, I forgot about that. Uh, Dana Gould is in the movie. Mm-hmm. He's the person who got into a car accident with Evie. Mm-hmm. Um and then Ron Matthews plays Stevie, who's this very hunky man. And I was looking for him to see if he worked anymore. He he doesn't. He became a fitness trainer. So oh. people can hire him. Oh, and this is uh, directed. This is the debut of Richard Day, who I believe is more of a producer. He did a movie after this that I've never seen called Straight Jacket. No relation to the Joan Crawford, William Castle oh. uh, classic. But... In 2012, apparently, they all got together and made a sequel that has never been released anywhere. I know. I would love to watch that Because I think all of the leads have talked about it at some point, and it's just never seen the light of day. I don't know what will have to happen. Someone will need, like a key person will need to die so we can get this movie released. I don't know. But um, I think it's also worth noting that uh, I've seen an interview with Varla Jean Merman talking about how she envisioned Varla as the love child of Ethel Merman and Ernest Borgnine because she had read Ethel Merman's memoir and about her marriage to Ernest Borgnine. It's one chapter that's blank, like it's a blank page. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> I would recommend this movie. It's uh, you know, it's inappropriate. It it I don't know. It it gives me like older queen vibes. Oh, for sure. Like yeah. when I was like in the 90s as a a young person and being around older gay men and they would introduce certain films, certain kind it. of things. Like this feels like that to me now. Yes. Um it's it's enjoyable. It does look really cheap, but you know, I but it's know. watchable I don't, it is very watchable yeah. the three leads are very good yeah. uh but we let the trailers play on my old ass dvd of this and it all of the indie films that were coming out u.s indie films in the early 2000s were so ugly it's shot on digital because <laughs> there was a preview for pieces of april with katie holmes I'm like this <laughs> that looks terrible what would you i mean give, i've seen that but it, the look of the film what would you give girls will be girls uh three and a half I would give it three and a half out of five as well. 
Uh, so this is Christmas week. Mm -hmm. So there will be no screenings. No. And I, the only possible release that if you wanted to watch it before the end of the year would be Ferrari. Cause that opens. No, week. thank you. Oh, um, we're not doing Ferrari. Okay. No, but we can work on content for the Patreon. Is there anything else you'd like to say? Well, we not. Well, I already have a bunch of screeners for stuff opening in January. Ugh. All right. Is that all? Sure. Ta-ta. Thank <laughs> you.